Hello, everybody. Dr. Nick Thomas here with another great episode of The Hospitality Spirit. Today, I am joined by Rich Centolella. Uh, Rich is a landscape architect and urban planner with EDSA. He's been with them since 1985 after graduating from SUNY ESF at Syracuse University. Rich was elevated to the Council of Fellows in the American Society of Landscape Architects in 2016. Over his 36 years with EDSA, Rich has been involved in developing EDSA's presence in geographic markets in Santa Monica, California, the Washington, Baltimore area, and New York City. In addition, his diverse experience with EDSA has taken him to places such as China with work on the Mission Hills Group, Tuscany, Italy for work with the Ferragama family, at the Rosewood Castiglione del Bosco, and more recently to the Middle East for work in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Because of the relationships he has skillfully developed around the globe and his ability to nurture the next generation of landscape architects, clients call Rich when they need innovative and creative design and an undying determination for getting projects built. Rich, welcome to the podcast. Nick, thanks for having me. So, Rich, we always like to start out the hospitality spirit, uh, just getting a, um, to start at the present, uh, and then we work our way back, and then we go off on some tangents. So, why don't we talk a little bit of first about what EDSA is and what your role as a landscape architect and urban planner with them is? Yeah, so... Thanks, Nick. EDSA is a um, landscape architecture planning and urban design firm. Uh, we were started in 1960 um, by our founder, Edward Durrell Stone Jr. Ed's father was a, a pretty famous um, building architect and uh, a lot of notable buildings across the U.S. and, and, um, and uh, outside the country. So Ed decided to become a landscape architect after his stint at the um, Harvard Graduate School of Design and started his own firm in, in 1960 in Fort Lauderdale, where we're still headquartered today. Um, you know, our, our work as landscape architects um, takes us uh, around the globe. We, we have a, a very strong focus on resorts and hospitality mm -hmm. projects, uh, also um, uh, urban planning projects, parks, uh, and uh, streetscapes. Um, and then um, you know, community planning as well. So if there's a new community being built uh, somewhere around the world, um, uh, we might have a hand in it. Interesting. How did you get involved in, in kind of this side of it? I mean, I know you went to school for this. Is that, is it, is it kind of the, the chicken and the egg? Did you know you wanted to do this and you just happened to fall into a company that does hospitality landscapes or was it, is something, this something you knew that you wanted to do your whole life? Well, um, it's a great question, and I grew up in a family that owned a construction company in upstate New York, and um, you know we specialized in landscape construction, both at a residential scale and a commercial scale. So, at a young age, I was working in the nursery at the garden center. Um, when I was able to go out with the construction crews, I was working on projects, and um, and then um, you know after high school, um, I took some time off and. Uh, uh, I, I worked for my uncle for, for a few years and, and decided that I wanted to be a landscape architect because I had gotten a chance to work with landscape architects that had designed some of the projects that we were building. And my uncle at the time tried to talk me out of it and told me I'd never make any money as a landscape architect, <laughs> but I ignored what he said. And, um, and I started uh, at Cobleskill College with a two-year ag and tech degree uh, and specializing in um, uh, landscape design and, and horticulture. And then I transferred into the State University uh, College of Environmental Science and Forestry, which is based on the Syracuse University campus. Mm -hmm. And that, that was completed my, you know, uh, three-year design sequence there. And when I, I, um, I was about to graduate, one of the partners at EDSA who had grown up in Syracuse and still had family there came back to do some recruiting and asked me to uh, interview uh, while he was visiting college. And, and you know, I, I had no intention of moving to Fort Lauderdale. I had gone to college late and started a family. And, um, and 
uh, I, I really didn't think that um, I would be going to Fort Lauderdale, but I did interview with this partner and um, a few weeks later accepted the job in 1985 and, and started my career with EDSA and, and been there for approaching 60 years now. That's great. What, so I'm, I'm trying for the, the listeners that are maybe not familiar with, with kind of the role of a landscape architect in this process, but are pretty familiar with hospitality and tourism and the types of places we have, you know, where does the, the landscape architect in terms of a timeline come into play when, when opening up a new resort? So for example, um, I've been very fortunate to open up a couple big properties out in Las Vegas, big mega resorts and realize there's, you know, there's a lot of people involved in, in just the planning. Um, even before demolition of the existing property happens, there's, there's people involved. Where does the landscape architect and, and what's the role of the landscape architect in that process? Yeah, so the role of the landscape architect could start very early. And if a client has, uh, let's say, a few hundred acres uh, somewhere, um, and, and it could be a coastal property, a mountain property, and, and wants to um, figure out what to do with that piece of land, a landscape architect will come in. And, and start the master planning for that big parcel of land, whether it's mm. a, a couple hundred acres or a couple thousand acres or tens of thousands of acres. We'll understand how you circulate through the property with roadways, where the development parcels will be, will be um, where the hotel will be located or multiple hotels, where the housing will be, where the commercial district will be, all woven into you know the natural fabric of the land, where the wetlands are, the, the coastal dunes, the the, the steep slopes will have to work with all the natural features so that we're not destroying that piece of land. Mm-hmm. And then once the master plan is complete, that you'll have several individual projects that will will sprout from that master plan. Um, many many of uh, the projects will you know that we work on are resort related, and um, and so we'll go in and 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 start to do the site plan for that specific hotel site. So we'll we'll understand where the entrance needs to be. How to how to site the buildings on the property for the best views, um, uh, the best um, uh, value for the property, um, especially if it's real estate and you're selling selling real estate. You want to you you want to have a high quality value to that real estate. So um, it's it's view oriented, it's access oriented, um, and then uh, once the site plan is settled down, and we'll work with the architect this whole time as well because mm-hmm. he's designing he or she is designing the buildings. And once we get the site plan settled down where the the main core is located and all the, all the, the room bays or the room uh, pods are located, um, then we'll start to do uh, uh, more typical landscape architecture where we're designing the roadways, the pathways, the swimming pools, the landscape itself, the plazas, the hardscape, um, the outdoor dining venues, uh, everything down to the site lighting and and s- specifying the, the the furniture the outdoor furniture and um in the irrigation system as well as working with civil engineers on drainage um and uh utilities so it's it can start very early in master planning or it can start um at the site design uh scale or um you know on some projects unfortunately the architects have already done the site design and we have to come in and and and, and probably move a few things around so mm-hmm. the site works a little bit better. That's really interesting and and it you know it's I'm curious at this point how when somebody comes to you and they say I've got a couple hundred or a couple thousand or 10,000 acres of land I mean do you find that for the most part they come to you already with that master vision in mind and, and your vision is just to turn that into a reality or or is part of what you do um, with EDSA is to help help them with that vision. They say, you know what, I know I want to put a hotel here, but I'm not really sure what I want it to to be like. Yeah, I think we have clients that run the full gamut. Some clients are landowners that have know nothing about development, know nothing about different types of development, whether it's a residential community or a commercial development or a resort development. And then we have other clients that are very sophisticated. Um, uh, you know, uh, for instance, Marriott owns some of their own properties. And so, you know, as, as far as when they go into a development, they know what they're going to develop. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we have a client that's 
sort of new at this, but has a lot of land and, and, and usually, um, you know, the wherewithal financially to develop, whether it's their own money or they're bringing in partners for investment. Um, you know, we have to start with understanding what the land is all about, the natural features that we don't want to mess up. So we do a heavy analysis. And today with all the uh, uh, the technology we have, we can do a lot of that desktop, but we like to do that in the field. We like to walk the property, photograph it. Now we're using drones. We're using a lot of GIS technology and other technologies to help us understand what is really there from a, a land and natural features point of view. And then on the other side, um, we usually have a firm that will start a market study uh, in advance of our design work or planning work so that we understand what the market demands are. You know, what type of hotel? Is it going to be ultra luxury? Is it going to be a four star? Is it going to be a three star? How many hotels? How many? How much real estate can be built on that piece of land? What type of real estate? How big are the lots? How big are the villas? So what's going to sell in the market? Because we can't just make that up. That has That's a specialty. And then once we're given that program, we can start to fit those pieces into the piece of land where they really will create the most value for the total development. So it's not it's um, it's something that has to evolve over uh, several months um, between the site analysis and the market study. And then we come up with that early master plan. So we start to sort out where all the parts and pieces are going to be. That's fascinating. Um, yeah. What what I've you know, doing some background on, on EDSA and, and what you do, what really struck me was the diversity of locations um, that you've done work. And, yeah. you know, listeners to the podcast know that, you know, I've lived abroad, I've traveled abroad, whether it's in Asia, the Middle East, and just culturally speaking, there's so much difference in terms of customer preference. So if we take, mm-hmm. you know, you mentioned Marriott earlier, if we take a, a, a Marriott in Santa Monica, California, and a Marriott in Shanghai, they may be the same number of rooms, but virtually everything about the guest experience, the guest preference is going to be very different. How do you incorporate those unique cultural nuances into this design? So whether it's it's Tuscany, whether it's China, whether it's KSA, I mean, how are you incorporating that? Because that's a huge component of making the vision of a successful reality, not just a reality? Yeah, yeah. Another great question because um, it differs around the world so much, you know, and especially even within a region like KSA is much different than Dubai right now. Mm-hmm. And one day it may be the same, but right now it's it's much different. So um, I think it started back, you know, 60 years ago when, when Ed Stone started EDSA and Ed Stone's father was doing work internationally Mm -hmm. and, and father being a building architect, son being a landscape architect and planner. Um, we would piggyback on, on, uh, uh, Ed Stone seniors projects and, and go to the middle East and, and go to South America and Latin America. And, and you, you, you learn these things. I mean, you, you have to learn by being there. Mm-hmm. And and so I think, you know, when you look at EDSA, there's an experience level there that you don't find in a lot of firms, whether it be architecture, engineering or landscape architecture. Because when we started in 1960, we had the senior leadership. I think we have uh, of those original partners. There's one person left. But over the years, they handed down that knowledge and that experience uh, to a second generation, and we're handing it down to a third generation, and we have a fourth generation coming in behind them. So it's it's learning learning these lessons as you experience these projects and handing down that knowledge. And um, and our our transition plan for ownership has worked out well. So we have this continuum, but you know nothing can replace a, a couple aspects. One is really getting into the research ahead of time and understanding where you are um, and and some of, you know, some of the history, the culture about the place you're going to be visiting very soon if you've never been there. Mm-hmm. And, the, and the second is we have a pretty diverse staff. We have staff from all over the world. We have staff, uh, you know, that are from the Middle East, uh, all throughout Latin America, um, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, 
Um, and so, and we have an office in Shanghai, China with, you know, 18 Chinese staff, and we probably have another uh, dozen or so Chinese employees in our U.S. offices. So, um, you know, it can't, nothing can replace somebody being from a, a place. They bring that knowledge to the team and they share that knowledge. And, you know, design is all about sharing and, and sharing ideas and, um, uh, and, and working together to work work out issues that that need to be worked out. I'm so, I'm so glad to hear you say that. I, I, it makes me reflect back on to uh, when I was opening up the Win out in Vegas. One of the one of my mentors um, who oversaw training and development came to me as we were talking about our recruitment strategy, and he passed on a, a really simple saying, and it still sticks with me today. And you've just kind of reaffirmed it. It said, "You want to hire." diverse employees that match the diversity of your customers. And yeah. that's the only way that you're truly going to provide a guest experience that is holistic, that's, you know, utilitarian, that can meet everybody's expectations. If you have a very, um, if you have a very homogenous group of employees in terms of their life experience and where they're from and different representation, you're going to provide a very homogenous experience for your customers. So, so I really love to hear you say that that diversity is actually something that helps you meet your strategic goals within EDSA. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a must, especially in the hospitality business because, you know, most hotels, most resort hotels um, around the world and, and I, you know, hospitality has a, a, a really wide definition. So there's, urban business hotels and there's city hotels and, and then there's resort hotels. Well, you know, people are coming from far away. So even if it's just traveling in the U S you know, a hotel is going to be different in California than it is in Florida. Mm -hmm. The, 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 you know, there's just the whole, um, I don't know, the whole vibe about the two States is totally different. Totally um, different. It, no, nothing to do with politics. It's just, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And, and, and then, you know, obviously when you go to Italy, Italy is much different than the Middle East and, and, and you have people traveling from all over the world. So if you don't understand that, then you, you can't create that, that hospitality experience, that guest experience that, uh, where people feel comfortable. And, um, I think it's important, you know, hospitality. We, we did a, a lot of work for Saul Kirshner, who um, came came to the U.S. from South Africa and came to the Western Hemisphere, I say, and, and to the Bahamas in 1994. And we started working for him. And we're still working for his company, Kirsch, Kirshner International. Mm -hmm. um, Saul left us last year. He, he, he passed away, but he left such a legacy of, of leaders in the industry um, and they've gone on to be one of them's the CEO of Hard Rock uh, International. Another one is the CEO of Dira Gate, you know, one of the giant projects in Saudi Arabia. Um, and, and I can go on down the list, but they all have one thing in common. It's about that guest experience. Mm -hmm. If you're not blowing away the customer, if you're not uh, creating the ultimate service um, environment, then you've, you've really failed. And um, it's really about service and, and the guest experience. And, you know, when you talk about resorts, landscape architecture is all about the outdoors, creating that experience outside of the buildings. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's, and it's, it's almost, you know, as a landscape architect, I'll say it's more important than the buildings themselves, because that's where most of the people spend their time when they're out at a resort. It's, it's in the out, outside environment and, and that, and that's our job to, to create that. And, um, and so, it, all of that ties together um, with diversity and, and the offerings that you're giving uh, the, the guest. And I think a lot of it too is, I mean, there's a lot riding on those decisions. I mean, I take a look, I take a look at, you know, KSA, for example, and, you know, over the last couple of years, they've been really going full steam ahead on their, on kind of their branding and, and their tourism strategy. I mean, 10 years ago, you really didn't see the, the Saudi Arabian tourism ads um, and really the videos and the drive to bring inbound tourism. But, you know, just mm -hmm. as of late, you've started to see that. And I would imagine that, that you have an impact on that, that what you create needs to not just be functionally practical, but also visually really appealing because that's, what's going to bring in the guests. Yeah. And uh, you're absolutely right. And we're, we're, we're working on three of the, what, 
what they call the Giga projects in in Saudi Arabia right now, and um, all three have a very different aesthetic. There, you know, one is is rooted in in the natural environment and in, in the coast, and um, and it being a very low scale, uh, very high end luxury uh, experience. And another one is located pretty close to Riyadh, the capital city, mm-hmm. and is all about entertainment. And um, it's it's a it could be very much you know equated to a, a Disneyland uh, for the Middle East. Um, mm-hmm. It'll have theme parks, it'll have golf courses, it will have uh, a city center, it, it will have um, a, 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 a Formula One track, um, and and I can go on down the line of all the entertainment features that the project will have. And it'll have a very different aesthetic and, uh, you know, visual quality to it. It'll be it'll be about entertainment, you know, uh, whereas the Red Sea that I described earlier will be more about, you know, sort of uh, uh, elegant and, and being, you know, very uh, a peaceful, uh, uh, high end hospitality experience. Um, and so it's it's you have to. You know, that that programming I talked about earlier on a master planning scale even applies, you know, on individual project scale. And um, that program is very important for us to be able to design those environments uh, for the people that they're serving and for their offerings, what they're offering. Um, So it's it's really understanding that. And, you know, the the years of experience that uh, we, we all have at EDSA really helps us. Uh, focus in on on what those experiences need to be because it's really about the experience you're creating at the end of the day, right? It could look great um, and it could it could function great, but if you don't feel great when you're in that um, in, in that project or you know at that venue or or doing whatever you're doing, um, you know uh, when it comes to entertainment, um, then you know, you've probably lost the battle with the guests. They're not going to come back. So but you have to create, create that feeling. Yeah. So the, the reality of it is, is you're, you're doing all this now in the present day in a somewhat of a unique situation uh, with the global pandemic. I mean, I think people are looking, uh, and I think you would probably agree that we're looking at space utilization, things like capacity, functionality. We're all now looking at it a little bit different. How has the the presence of this pandemic and this new emphasis on these other variables started to influence how you're designing things as a landscape architect? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it depends on the project, really. Um, I think you know some of the Red Sea work is not going to be open for another couple of years, or uh, any of the work in the KSA is not going to be open for a couple of years, so. Um, we're really focusing on, um, you know, what we really want it to be ultimately. And, and, um, you know, the pandemic, uh, is affecting those projects basically on how we're getting our work done present day. It's, Mm -hmm. it's not, it's really, it's, it's not affecting, um, what we're designing because it's so far out there. And we're, I think, uh, we're pretty confident that, you know, we're going to get over this and, uh, people are, you know, going to get back to normal if it's not this year if, next year and you know definitely within you know two or three years so um but then there's some more immediate needs of projects that are already in place and and you know communities that just need help to open a small business which mm-hmm. you know we've been involved in and and uh, creating environments where people are can feel safe today right now and environments that can be built at a low cost, uh, whether they're temporary or they might turn into something more permanent with a little bit of extra cost. Um, uh, you know, that's an important right now to get, you know, communities and businesses back on their feet. So, you know, in, in our urban design, uh, role, um, in, in like our hometown of Baltimore, uh, one of our hometowns of Baltimore, we, um, We've gone in with the neighborhood uh, uh, design um, uh, uh, organization and the city and some of the neighborhoods. And um, we've contributed uh, with 10 other design firms 
um, how to create safe outdoor spaces for these urban businesses to reopen. That's great. Uh, we did that. We did that last summer, and um, and they they published a guideline for for uh, anybody that can download, whether it's uh, your business owner or not. And you know, we went in and, and looked at a, a couple neighborhoods in Federal Hill mm-hmm. here, where one of our partners actually lives, and um, came up with a plan to adapt a few streets to um, make outdoor dining more comfortable, um, uh, make the traffic a, a bit more safe, um, make sure that we have proper social distancing. Um, and uh, and then how does it all really look good and make people feel comfortable that where they really want to be there? You know, and I'll use a, a quick story at one of our favorite restaurants here in Baltimore opened up last summer. Uh, with outdoor dining, it's it, it's it's in one of the northern suburbs. It, it is not it's not downtown or in Federal Hill. And um, when we got there, this is a really fine dining French restaurant. We got there for brunch on a Sunday, and it was in the parking lot. And mm. they really didn't do anything special to the parking lot other than bring some tables out there. And um, it was not a great experience. So, um, but you know what we we tried to do with some of this. Um, this uh, planning uh, to improve, um, you know, how these businesses could open up was really look at how people will feel comfortable eating outdoors. And it won't look like it was just thrown together at the last minute. It, it looks like it's purposeful. It feels comfortable. People want to be there. And, uh, and, and it's, uh, again, it, it goes back to, you know, what we talked about in hospitality. It's about the guest experience. Sure. And it's interesting because, you know, as growing up in the, the Baltimore area, I mean, the the outdoor dining experience is, is so important. I mean, I go back and I think about all the times that we would get a couple picnic tables together, throw some newspaper down and dump some some crabs on the table and just sit out there and enjoy it. And it's, you know, that was a part of life. But the challenge that you have is, is particularly now during COVID, is that outdoor dining experience is, needs to be almost year round at times. And yeah needs to remain totally functional. I mean, we would, we wouldn't eat blue crabs on a, on a picnic table in the middle of winter. And, and, you know, someplace where Miami or Santa Monica, where you've got pretty nice weather year round, the the reality of it is, is in a place where there's four very different seasons, it it must present a challenge. Well, it does, but you know, you, you even have those challenges in, in places like uh, Miami and, and Santa Monica and Miami in the summertime, you don't, really don't want to be out, outside well, Saudi Arabia in the, in the summertime. Yeah. Somebody that was in yeah. Bahrain in the summertime, I can, uh, I can tell you what it was yeah. like. It was hot. Yeah. And you know, like, um, so I think it, there's ways to adapt for all different locations. Um, mm-hmm. you know, Santa Monica has their rainy season for a month or so. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it never comes, but, um, you know, the, the winter this year in Baltimore was very mild. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't remember we had more than a couple inches of snow at any one time. And that might have happened once or twice. And, and in January, I was out on our tennis court with my granddaughter uh, hitting tennis balls for most of January. Wow. And 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 um, uh, she's getting really good. She's only five. So you just watch for her in a couple of years. I TV. sure will. <laughs> we'll but, mark um, down the name. You, you heard it here <laughs> first on the Hospitality Spirit, uh, future tennis star. Yes, but it, 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 it depends on where you are and, um, you know, there's, there's ways to adapt um, and it, it's, it's all part of design. You just True. have to work at it. Yeah. So I would imagine, so, you know, 36 years with EDSA, I can imagine that you've seen some amazing innovation uh, in the way that design occurs. You know, one of the things that I can imagine that you've really seen and really become intimately involved with is this idea of sustainability and kind of this greater focus on kind of going green, not just from a corporate social responsibility perspective, but also from a purely cost savings and maximization of revenue perspective. What are some of the things right now in terms of trends that you're seeing in your design firm? that the clients are asking for or you're recommending to them with the hat of sustainability on? Yeah, that's a, um, it's really an important issue these days, but as landscape architects, we feel that we've been practicing sustainable design for a long, long time. It's some of the things that are really cool to do today. We were doing way, way back when, and it's just, um, you know, like the way uh, stormwater is treated, you know, um, uh, 
everything, you know, uh, would be piped into um, storm sewers and, and taken away. Uh, and nowadays, um, we really care about what happens to that stormwater. We want to clean it before it gets back into the environment. So designing a site with bioswales is very important where water will go into a swale with certain types of vegetation. It'll be cleaned before it goes back into the groundwater. And, or, you know, if it's near a coastal area, it's even more important. Mm-hmm. Bioswales have become uh, so much a part of design these days that you're, you're seeing um, like Pratt Street along the harbor in Baltimore, a very urban environment. But all those, all the, um, all the plazas in, uh, of the, of the um, uh, businesses that front Pratt Street now um, are there, they've created this bioswale system. So on, any of the water that runs off from the street and the plaza goes into the bioswale before it drains into the harbor. So that's, that's an important thing when it comes to storm drainage, but probably even more important is, you know, our, our, um, our looking at how our projects are becoming more resilient, you know, sea level rise is important. We just had a, a design review from, for some of our projects with the Red Sea in, in Saudi Arabia. And the Red Sea project is, you know, they're developing these islands in the Red Sea. And, and obviously these small islands are, are going to be very susceptible to mm-hmm. sea level rise. So how do you design um, and how far in the future do you design? That's the other predicament. Is it for the next 25 years, next 50 years, next 100 years? And they all have a, a cost, um, uh, you know, uh, implication and uh but we also have to do the right thing and um and so um we've just done a a um a study down in um Key Biscayne uh for one of uh the big developers down there and they're trying to make their their land more sustainable more resilient to sea level rise and storm surge especially with the hurricanes mm-hmm. and instead of building a concrete wall we're helping develop a series of 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 berms that act like um, dunes in the bay that help um, function just like a seawall at a higher level, but wow. but can be turned into a park so people could actually use this land. And um, and so I'd rather be surrounded by a nice uh, park with bounds and dunes and pathways and overlooks than have a seawall built in front of my property that you can't even see over that will block views from the first floor. So. Mm. Um, it's, it's how you handle some of these, uh, mechanisms to make projects, um, more resilient and more sustainable. One of the, one of the projects that you worked on that I was really intrigued by is I used to live down in Palm Springs. So I'm really familiar with Mission Hills and then living in Asia and traveling throughout China extensively. Your, your Mission Hills project in China really intrigued me. Um, what what were some of the sustainabilities? I mean, if you're going to future proof that as well from from a sustainability perspective, it's not obvious, obviously sea rise isn't going to impact that. What are some of the sustainability issues that you deal with with something like a golf course and creating that sort of facility? Yeah, I think uh, on a golf course, uh, you know, a lot of a lot of the issues on golf course are. Um, you know, how do you design the drainage on a golf course so so um, the the fertilizers and chemicals you use are really um, being spread all over the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, technology on golf these days is um, it's gotten gotten a lot better uh, with the types of fertilizers and chemicals that can be used on a golf course. Uh, much more organic materials and and um, but the you know, obviously you still have to be careful, uh, with how the course drains. Um, and you know, we're trying to limit the amount of turf areas so that the use of water is limited. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're not, uh, you're not, uh, creating more grass than you really need. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, one of the big sustainability issues with golf is also financial sustainability. Mm -hmm. Um, they, they uh, they take up a lot of land. Um, they cost a lot to maintain, and um, and if that's going to sort of break the bank for the project, whether it be a residential project or a hotel project or a combination of, you have to be careful about um, you know how much land you're taking out of uh, out for the golf course and uh, taking away from from other uh, other product that 
that could benefit um, financially benefit the project. So, um, you know, sustainability, everybody looks at it as like being really good to the environment, but there's also financial sustainability that's probably just as important um, because a project has to be financially feasible at the end of the day. I agree. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Rich, I think you've, during our conversation, and this will kind of be the final question, but during our conversation, you've really reemphasized something that we continuously say on the hospitality spirit that, you know, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different opportunities and jobs that you can have in the hospitality industry. And then all of the kind of careers on the periphery that influence hospitality. So while you're working for EDSA and you might not be in the quote unquote hospitality business, you're absolutely having an impact on it. So the final question would, would really be if someone wanted to go down this, this path that you did, what sort of training, what sort of education are you recommending that, that someone gets under their belt and is the traditional route to just apply for an internship, apply for like an apprenticeship? What's the traditional route that somebody takes to get in with a company like EDSA? Yeah, um, when it's when you're talking about companies like EDSA, architecture, engineering firms, um, I think I think the you know the best way is um, well, my route was you know I worked in the construction business, which is really related to the design business. We can't build it until it's designed, so mm -hmm. it led me to school, which led me to EDSA. But we have a very robust intern program at EDSA. We have four sessions a year. Um, we just hired um, 17, wow. 17 new interns uh, for this year, um, or was it twelve? We, yeah, but we uh, we hired uh, all together with entry level. We hired about thirty new people, wow. at, at least a, at least a dozen or interns for this this summer. That's we'll pretty another, optimistic for the industry yeah. as a whole. I mean, if if that yeah. sort of development and growth is happening, I mean that that kind of that kind of is a, a badge of affirmation to say, you know, the rebound is coming. Well, I mean, it, it is, it is. Um, people are feeling, feeling safer. We're talking with all the hotel chains right now that are um, uh, signing on to projects, whether, you know, most of the hotel chains are not funding these projects. Um, I just was on the phone last night with the, uh, the, the head of uh, um, um, real estate for Marriott and, you know, they're very, very positive in Asia, um, in, in, in the Middle East. Um, they're, they're, they're very, their outlook is really positive. So, um, you know, I, I think um, there's going to be a lot of opportunity both on the design side and in the, the pure hospitality side. The, 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 all the brands are, are there's going to be a pent up demand that's uh, people at, at some point by the end of the year or next year are going to feel safe to travel again and enjoy themselves again and, and be social again. And, um, you know, I, I just, it's, it's, it, it has to happen sooner or later. So, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, when you're young and you're learning, I mean, don't rule out anything. I, one of our clients t told a story and, and it, it, it is exactly what happened to me. Um, when I was young, I, I took a job as a bus boy in a restaurant in, in my hometown. It, and, um, and I got into, learning, you know, how a restaurant works. And that's a big part of hospitality is the, the F and B business. And then, mm -hmm. and then I, I, uh, ended up working for my uncle in the construction business and got into, uh, to be a landscape architect and ADD, EDSA. But what we do in, in the resort design world is an important part of hospitality. It's we're everything that we design, we have to keep the guest in mind. Mm -hmm. So we're learning every day. And, um, you know, the best way to, to do that as, as a young person coming out of school is get a, get a job as an intern, intern while you're in school and, um, and, uh, um, or even hiring interns that have graduated just, you know, for a test period in the, in the beginning and, um, and just soak it up and learn and ask questions and get involved. And it's really important. Well, as you've, uh, I promise I didn't plant this, uh, but you've just mm -hmm. reaffirmed what we would say all the time, that education doesn't replace work experience and work experience doesn't replace education. You, you got to have both. And the sooner you realize that as a, as a young professional and you get out there and you get your first job, um, you're well on your way. Um, 
So that's that's great to hear that that it, the same holds true in in your mind. Yeah, and, and I think that's that's a really accurate statement. And um, you know, I took a weird route through my education. I didn't. I took some time off, um, sort of forcibly took some time off from uh, my first college endeavor, and then went back to college after I worked for a few years. And I graduated when I was 26, and I had already started my family. Um, and uh, you know, since leaving Syracuse and Syracuse University, uh, I've you know visited. 65 countries, I think the list is wow. now. And, um, uh, you know, uh, now I'm one of the oldest guys in the firm where I can remember it was yesterday where I just, you know, just started my career. It, it's gone by very fast. So I think I wouldn't have been at EDSA if I didn't go to school and I didn't meet some of the partners. So, you know, that's another thing about, about getting an education. It, it opens up a lot of doors to networking and, and, um, finding out really, it's that exploration period of what you want to do and where you want to do it. And, um, and, and, uh, it, it, it opens up a lot of doors. So I think it's, they're both very important. Yeah, not only will you explore the world, but you'll also, there's a lot of self exploration uh, involved in that. So, Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Rich, I can't thank you enough for being a guest on the hospitality spirit today. This was a really exciting conversation. I learned a lot and I'm sure the listeners did as well. So thank you for being a guest. Well, Nick, thanks for having me. I appreciate it.